Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Blue Bank Resort on Real Foot Lake. If you're looking for the best place on the lake for fishing, eagle watching, or enjoying some of the best catfish in the region, you'll find it at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com and reserve your cabin today. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Julie Hill, who is the chair of the Department of Music at the University of Tennessee at Martin. Julie shares with Scott what motivates her as an educator in West Tennessee, Brazil, and the rest of the world. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week, just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, we explore the culture, spirit, accomplishments, and the heritage of our beautiful home here in West Tennessee. This week's guest is a performer, a scholar, an educator, a supporter of the arts, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and I could go on and on and on. Julie here, who is with me here today, is the chair of the Department of Music at the University of Tennessee at Martin. Julie has received worldwide recognition and has presented workshops, concerts, and lectures extensively throughout the United States on Brazilian music and the topic of music and social transformation for black women and at-risk children in northeastern Brazil. As a member of the award-winning Kaisha and 10-4 Quartet, Julie has performed in Peru, Poland, Mexico, Brazil, Taiwan, France, Puerto Rico, South Korea, and it goes on and on and on across the, and across the United States. And if that is not enough, she is the principal percussionist with the Paducah Symphony Orchestra, and she also has a little side project she's working on that involves restoration of a historic property. We're going to hear about that as well. Thank you for coming, Julie. Thank you for having me, Scott. You have quite the radio voice. I did not realize that. You perked it up a little there. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've had a lot of coffee here today. <laughs> um, so first of all, before we dive into what makes you tick and how you got, where you got, tell me what you're doing. I like to start off right where we are today. What, what's going on with you in your life? Well, in, in my life right now, it's sort of triple faceted, I suppose, or maybe a little bit more, but um, just always trying to help my department and the campus overall at UT Martin just be the best it can be. So uh, working on that hard all the time. Um, and then uh, more recently have been working about a year with a couple of colleagues uh, on the Weekly Arts Can Foundation, which is a, non, a new nonprofit I'm a part of, working with Weekly County School Board to try and increase the arts offerings in Weekly County. And we hope this can become a model for other rural communities across the South who have been shrinking in their arts offerings for students. Uh, and then personally, I've been working on a lot of restoration in my neighborhood of downtown Union City, Tennessee, which my husband refers to as mini Detroit. Uh, and so we're trying to, as Detroit has done, um, help our neighbors in our city uh, to fix up our little small piece of the pie in Union City. And so what are you going to end up with when you're done fixing this space up? Well, we, we've done, well, our house, um, all these houses are over 100 years old. And so we kind of started with the house David and I live in. We've been in Union City 14 years. And uh, we, we found that we enjoyed doing that together. Um, I'm a musician. He's a historian. David's also a musician, but, you know, it's it's a job for me and it's fun for him. And so we found that we liked doing things outside and landscaping and then home restoration was something we really enjoyed doing together. We didn't think we'd enjoy it this much, um, but we bought the little house behind us when it came for sale and we converted that into a vacation rental. Most people don't know that term. They know Airbnb type thing, but that's, you know, so we've been renting that out 25 nights a month on the average, uh, which is really great because then we foolishly bought a house down the street uh, when it came up for sale. Uh, Miss Ann Moore was selling it and it 
It uh, was built in 1893, and it's on the historic registry. And it needs a lot of work, uh, and it's probably going to be May before we have it finished, but it'll be almost a year of working on that house. And uh, it will be an event and wedding venue, so we hope people have their parties and weddings there. And that one's called Historic Anne's 1893, and it's on has a Facebook page, and it will soon have a website. And the vacation rental is called Gloria's on Exchange. We named it for Gloria, who we bought it from, and that has a website and a Facebook page if anybody wants to see them. That's amazing. So see, you're adding real estate model to this and you're adding tour and travel hotelier. Yeah, we, there were there were two houses that were condemned that we actually purchased and had them raised ourselves as well. So we've created some green spaces in the neighborhood too. So my, my neighbor, Ray, that works for you all here, he's a security guard. He's like, you're not going to buy my house, are you? And I was like, you're safe, Ray. <laughs> that sounds like, that's and a I, great Ray impersonation. Thanks. That sounds like Ray. Um, so, I mean, clearly you're very successful successful and you found all these outlets, you and your husband, for your uh, creative pursuits. You know, what? what is it like to be a person who is passionate about the arts in a more rural setting? You know, you may find more people in a big metropolitan city, you know, who are into percussion and music and, and you know, so how, how have you fed that um, part of your life? Well, I have always been one to believe in that well, Gandhi, be part of the change. And how can you expect an area to grow and prosper and change if you don't help it along the way? And um, I'm originally from West Tennessee, and I lived away for a long time. What and, city were you from? Um, from Martin. Oh, okay, great. And most people don't know that. Um, yeah. Maybe I've lost some of the accent, but I can turn it on if I need to. <laughs> um, but yeah, was was away for a long time and then had the opportunity to come back at UT Martin and and get the job who, of the lady who was my professor there, who's um, we're going to talk about a little bit later, one of my great mentors. Um, and didn't know if I would stay, frankly. Uh, it was the percussion professor there only for 10 years and then had the opportunity. My, my colleagues wanted me to lead the music department and I didn't know if I wanted to do that, but I gave it a try and they really liked what I did and I've enjoyed it. It's, it's different in administration. We still teach as well. Um, so it's, it's challenging to juggle everything and balance and, you know, my work-life balance gets way out of whack pretty much all the time, but that's kind of how I roll. And um, I've had a few bigger programs come after me, frankly, uh, through the years, which is a nice compliment. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always say that I I don't need prestige. I need purpose. Mm -hmm. And I have always felt so much purpose at UT Martin and in West Tennessee. And, and yeah, there are things that are not good here there. You know, there are things that, um, I don't agree with that I would like to change faster, but I have seen a lot of change along the way and enough that gives me the encouragement that I'm doing a few things for the community and for other students that were like me who needed those opportunities. And I I don't want to abandon that. I want to dig in with both feet, both hands with, with everything possible and, and help my community. Um, Some of the things that you want to change, I know are arts in the schools. It's sad to me that, that there's not more arts in the schools here in this area. Um, what, what is the um, Arts Can uh, program about? Yeah, so Weekly Arts Can is intended to be a group that connects parents, connects students, teachers, administrators, anyone who wants to be involved in supporting the arts and trying to connect some of those dots. Uh, a lot of the things that have happened with arts offerings uh, and, and those diminishing throughout the United States is, is not even at the fault of administrators nor school boards. I mean, it's all time and money. And we've, you know, test scores rule the world now. And so things get pushed after school or sometimes not at all. And, uh, you know, everyone's just trying to comply with state regulations so they can keep their funding, so they can, you know, look good to prospective parents and attract people to their community. So I, I think some of it, of course, is not intentional at all. It's happened over just gradually over the course in time. And unlike, uh, unfortunately, ath- athletic boosters, uh, I think those parents have really gotten involved right away and, you know, said, well, we'll have a booster program and they raise funds. But, you know, if they canceled a football team somewhere, people would be in outrage, but if they cancel art classes, not so much. But I I do think people care about that. It just takes a person, a group to coalesce and and get those people on board, like like you and your wife, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and just give them a means of saying, we do care about these things. This is important to us, but we really do have to say 
this is important to us and and um, that's what we're trying to do so if anyone wants information on that uh, have them please contact me we're easy to find on google and we do have a website already with a lot of information we're currently forming our board of directors uh, so we're just really getting started um, but we're really excited about partnering with the weekly county school board to try it's not going to be perfect we're not going to have everything back during the day right away like we'd love to have but even if we can form some increased general music art uh, drama you know and then expand that later to dance. Uh, of course, music is obvious for me um, during the school day for the younger children and then start with some after school county band orchestra types of models. That's not great. And it's expensive with transportation. But um, if you we, we didn't consolidate in Wickley County like Union City did or Obion County rather. So, you know, you can't it's too expensive to have those band programs at all those um, separate small communities um, because of staffing and instruments. And then if they were really small, the kids wouldn't feel good about them anyway. So we were thinking some county models where they can really take pride in what they're doing is, is at least a starting place. I think a lot of people don't understand that art is more than just sitting and drawing and coloring. I mean, it teaches you so many things um, that you can apply throughout. I mean, I was a sculpture major originally. So, you know, there, there are things you can learn from that and apply. And of course, my wife is an art teacher, as you mentioned. Yeah, we've got so much data now that we can, you know, say, hey, these the students that are involved in the arts, and you say art and they do think draw, but it's everything, music, drama, dance, visual art, theater art, um, the, the students do better. They, they do better academically, they're better at math, and they show up to school. Attendance goes through the roof when they're involved in these things because they want to do those things. They don't probably want to do RTI, even though they have to, but... Um, that it increases students' attendance, their uh, mental, their cog cognitive capacity, um, but it also gives them an outlet to feel, this is where I really feel strongly about it, though, is it gives them a means of feeling good about themselves. And we have so many kids that don't have those opportunities Rather through academics, you know, sometimes our athletic groups now cost so much money. So a student of lower socioeconomic level um, might not be able to afford those things. And certainly if they don't even offer those in those schools where those students live, that makes me so sad to think, how would my life have been completely transformed had not, I not had general music at K, the K through five level? I mean, I just can't imagine how different my life would be. And so I, I get sad, but I get fired up and, and angry and, and just want to do something to wake people up and, and just say, this stuff matters. We've got to give these students the at least the opportunity to express themselves in these ways. You know, here at Discovery Park of America, we have the Historic Theater Academy. And so students come and they pick a moment in history. The last group picked um, um, Hamilton and Burr, and then they actually do the research. They actually write the play, oh, and then they design great. the costumes, and they actually do the performance. Somebody will be in charge of the stage setting, and and these kids come from schools all over in the area. And one of the kids this last time when I was just talking to him said, um, "This is the only time I feel happy." <clears throat> and I thought, man, I imagine know, teardrops you know, fall. Yeah, it's just like how grateful we are, and and how many kids out there don't either know about it or don't get to, you know, participate. So that's one of my, you know, passion oh, things so, is to so wonderful get the word out that. about that. Yeah, oh, it's amazing. So and Before we leave that topic, though, yeah. Scott, I just wanted to also say the other thing we need to do is people need to come to these things and, you know, it, just attendance at some, sometimes at these events is, I think TV's gotten so good, and I get it, TV's great today, but turn off that set and go and support a living, working student or, you know, whether it's a faculty member or a community theater. But we have a lot going on in this area. And those people producing those things and performing in those things need to be appreciated. And it's great stuff, but we, we need folks to actually care and get up and, and go out and see things. Well, you know, the, uh, the theater here, the uh, Masquerade Theater yeah. is putting on Shrek tonight is the first night of Shrek. That's great. And so when um, my daughter's home from spring break, and so I was, you know, wanting to take her to see Shrek, and she loves theater. So, you know, when tickets were, were going to go on sale, I literally sat in front of my computer and hit refresh waiting for them because I thought they were going to all sell out, like, immediately. And I, I actually saw um, one of the characters from the play. I saw him earlier in, in here at Discovery Park, and he said they were about, you know, 75% sold out. But, you know, yeah, it's... Um, um, we, ha we have to change the mentality of people around here to appreciate those things. That That is 
an issue in West Tennessee. Well, and and this has a huge cast, and so to be able to see all these people that you know I see at the grocery store or at church or at the to see them on stage is going to be a lot of fun. I so, love Masquerade Theater. So tell me a little bit about um, young Julie Hill. How, how, what happened to get you here? What parents out there will want to know? What do I need to do with my kids to have them turn out to be Julie Hill? Well, um, that's very kind of you. Um, I had very supportive parents, um, but I also had parents that uh, did not have university degrees. They met at UT Martin, actually, in front of the administration building, um, but they ended up dropping out of school and getting married. And my dad was, well, my dad had a lot of different jobs through the years, and I won't share all those with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of them was truck driver. So mm-hmm. he was a truck driver, and I know how to drive everything <laughs> and back a trailer, which is great. Um, and then my mom had a daycare center. She was Dr. Baker's secretary in business at UT Martin for a number of years. And then when she had me, she stopped working, and um, she had a daycare in our home. So maybe that's why I don't have kids, but I had kids around me all the time my entire life. Yeah. And I still do, but yeah. they're a little older. Yeah. Um, but in fourth grade, uh, Miss Sandra Robbins, who just passed away this past year, uh, was my general music teacher. Well, let me back up one step. I'm, uh, first grade, my teacher, and uh, she's very special to me, and I talk to her a lot, Miss Mary Elizabeth Bell. She was just a, you know, the classroom teacher. You don't rotate for classes at that time, but she had instruments that she had made and she had them in buckets and we would go if we were good and we got to pick out our instrument and most of them were percussion instruments with sticks and rattles and jingles on them and I remember playing those instruments and loving them so I was like okay I, I like this music stuff and I wow. took piano lessons that's your mo you can kind of oh I remember the grabbing those things out of the bin I was five years old because I started school when I was four um, but I remember how much fun that was and then fourth grade, Miss Robbins was my general music teacher. And um, I wasn't, you know, bullied or anything, but I wasn't like the popular kid because we didn't have money. And she picked me out of the entire grade to play the, it was a tambourine, but it was like the drum part for the school play. It had a, it was a musical basically. And it was the, the rhythm part for the, for the musical. And I remember she said to me, Julie, you have uncanny rhythm. You have the best rhythm of anybody in this grade. And so you need to play the drum part. And I just beamed with pride. And I'll never forget her telling me that. And I told my mom that night. And my grandmother was very important in our family as well. My mom's mom. And she helped with the daycare center. And I said, I got picked for this part. I'm so excited. And I felt like I was special. Mm -hmm. And good at something, which is so critical. Mm -hmm. And mom and grandma put their money together and they took me to the leader store in Fulton, which was like the place at the time and bought me this fancy suit that had knickers and it was like <laughs> suede. And I just was like, I, and it cost like $50 or something. And I mean, yeah. I was just so incredibly proud. So that was two things that happened early on. Um, and then I had some, some great uh, mentors. I had some, some good teachers. Uh, I had a strong female role model in Bonnie Hernan, who was my high school band director. Uh, and then she introduced me to Nancy Matheson, uh, who would be very transformative in my life. Uh, she was the percussion teacher at UT Martin that I ended up replacing many, many years later. Uh, and she taught me private lessons in percussion. Um, at that point, I'd kind of lost interest in piano. It, was, it felt too refined to me, and I wanted to be a little bit crazier. Um, and you do go crazy. I, know, well, I watch that, you. I know pianists the, yeah. are crazy now, but at the time, I thought it was, they didn't do Well, I do see that. you on the drums. I've watched all your videos on there. Well, so. it, it's fun. Yeah, you cut up. It's fun. Thank you. I have the personality for it. <laughs> but uh, So she taught me lessons for free at 6 a.m. on Friday mornings. She was like, "You, if you want to have free lessons, you're going to have to show up, and I was there. And she taught me and uh, my senior year of high school, um, And then I don't want to get into too much detail, but I will say that what led me from a path of small town West Tennessee girl from non-college educated parents to researching the black music in northeastern Brazil um, and around the world, I've been so fortunate to perform around the world, is is being educated. Mm -hmm. It's getting a great education and not being afraid to take advantage of opportunities when they were thrown my way. So Mm -hmm. being fearless, Mm -hmm. um, not being like, oh, I can't do that. I don't have the ability or I can't do that. I want to stay home. But putting myself out of my comfort zone, um, you know, I I speak Portuguese. I went to a place where everybody's black and Mm -hmm. live there and, and, you know, I stick out. But not being afraid to do that, I mean, 
I have the confidence that I can do whatever I want to do. And, mm-hmm. and that impacts everything that you do. Um, and, and just, um, staying as broad. I say this to my students all the time with percussion. It's a big wide world of everything you can strike, shake or scrape. And it's really, people think it's easy and it is because that's percussion in one sense. But in another sense, there's this, every instrument you can imagine and every genre, every style from all these different countries, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, So I tell my students to stay as broad as they can for as long as they can, because the profession will define you. If you try to define yourself too early in the profession, Mm -hmm. you'll miss out on opportunities that you would have been offered along the way. Mm -hmm. So those are three things. Talk a little bit more about um, Brazil and your passion for the country and for the women there. Yes. So um, I left UT Martin and studied with this wonderful lady, Nancy Matheson that I, but you know, I was at Martin. It was a smaller school. And at that time they did not have a world music program. Uh, You know, we didn't even take drum set lessons. It was just the traditional stuff. And I felt like I really needed to go to a bigger state school. Um, The program's very different now in that way. Uh, So I thought, well, the biggest state school in the country is Arizona State University. Let's go check that out. And I loved it. And so I went to graduate school there straight from UT Martin. I was 21 years old. And uh, drove my Corolla out there with a U-Haul, got a, a hitch on it, and 1,750 miles, here we go. And it was like Mars out there. Wow. What did your parents think? They were scared to death I for bet me. they were. Dad had been out there as a truck driver. Mom had never been uh, west of the Mississippi. So she was, they put a bunch of canned tomatoes. Grandma and Mom gave me canned <laughs> tomatoes in my U-Haul and <laughs> loaded up and went out there. And uh, but, it, but it was great for me because I was exposed to all these different cultures. And I played in the steel band and Brazilian ensemble and, and not just the ensembles, the students, you know. So I started learning Portuguese very quickly and Spanish there and would go dancing with them and learning what that music sounded like. And I had always liked the exchange students, you know, as a kid, I'd always befriend the the runt of the litter, so to speak, or the people that, you know, didn't know anyone because I would see that they didn't have any friends. And I've always been that kind of person. And my first boyfriend boyfriend was Jorge, you know, so um, I've always been kind of a, attracted to learning about other places. And so that was a great place for me to stretch my wings. And um, my mom had gotten pretty sick. She had a disease called sarcoidosis through the years, and she was starting to decline um, rapidly around that time. And so when I finished grad school, uh, about the last thing I wanted to do was move back here, but I did because my mom was pretty sick. And there was a band directing job open at O'Brien County Central High School and some of the middle schools. And uh, I got the job there. And uh, my high school band director, Bonnie Hernan, was one of the teachers there. So that helped me get the job which was awesome, uh, and uh, kind of came back home and was suddenly teaching back out in the rural middle of nowhere. I mean, Black Oak, to me, that was my first job, and I showed up there, and I was like, am I ever going to get there? You know. And then I had to drive to the high school, but I met so many wonderful students, parents there that I see every day in this community. You know, They're like, hey, Miss Hill. We, you know, So it's nice. Um, and some of those students I taught them would later come study with me at UT Martin, actually. But um, I'm at one of my great students there. He was in seventh grade when I got the job. His name was Davey Anderson. And so Davey um, was just fantastic. And, and I thought, well, let's see if some, and, and some of these other kids were too, uh, Will Turner, there were lots of others. And uh, we formed a middle school percussion ensemble and we had a little steel band. So I was kind of trying to make some of that world music magic in Ob- at O'Brien County. And, mm-hmm. and it did. We did a lot of really cool things. And I said, well, there's this thing called the Percussive Arts Society that I've been a big part of, and they do an international convention every year. And I thought, these kids would love PASIC. Man, it's like candy land for drummers. Maybe their parents would let them go. Who knows? Well, you don't know if you don't ask. And that year it was in Orlando. And so I asked the percussion kids, I said, you know, I'm going to, I'd like to take some of you all there. Most of you are boys, though. I'd need a parent to go, you know, chaperone kind of thing. And and Davey said, I'll ask my mom. I think she might want to go. Well, sure enough, I meet these, I take these kids from, you know, from Troy and, and Hornbeak and, and we fly to Orlando and we go to this convention and oh my gosh, it was so great. But I met Davy's mom that day. We met to drive to the airport together and I heard her accent and I said, 
você é brasileira, amiga? And she was like, si! So she was from Brazilian, you know, oh, wow. and you're this kid, you know, yeah. his mom's Brazilian. I'm like, why are you in Union City? She said, well, my husband's a corn breeder for Pioneer, you know, so we have to live in rural places. Mm -hmm. And so then I started going to Brazil with her and her family, and she really helped me with my uh, Portuguese skills. And uh, her name's Joe Anderson. She still lives here, and her husband is Joseph Anderson, great people. Um, and uh, that's how I started traveling there pretty much every year. And then I ended up, once I got the language skills, uh, Josephine was not a, a musician. She was a friend helping me out. Uh, she got tired of translating all my lessons and all these interviews with people. And finally I got to where I could go by myself. And so oh. I've been back many, many, many times. Yeah, oh, And taken students there, UTM students, we've gone four times. Yeah, and obviously um, you have a passion for the people there and, and the transformative, it sounds like a cliche, but yeah. the transformative power of music it, to it, change it people's really, lives. It really does. And it's not dissimilar to what I was saying in the way that my own life was changed. Although I had clothes and, you know, a place to live and, and healthcare. Um, you know, the people in this area, Salvador is where my research is from. It's in the state of Bahia. So they call it Salvador da Bahia. Uh, it was the first port of entry for the slaves that came to Brazil and four times as many slaves went to Brazil as to the United States. So about 10 million, if that puts it into perspective. Last place in the world to abolish slavery in 1888. I mean, as a result, this place, Salvador, is still very black, about 90% black. And uh, it is extremely, extremely rich in culture and extremely poor in economic mm -hmm. uh, capacity. So mm -hmm. uh, it, a lot of the the kids there are homeless or, you know, there's a high crime rate there. If you look on the top 10 cities of crime in the, in the world, you'll see Salvador as one of them, mm -hmm. but it's an incredibly beautiful, rich place. But uh, this music that I researched called, it looks like Samba Reggae, it's Samba Hegi. They have these schools basically that take kids in, teach them how to play instruments, drums, and then they play out in the streets for rehearsals and tourists come listen to them and they give concerts and do tours. And it's that sense of knowing that you're good at something it changes your life. So they know the path of least resistance, which is selling drugs or stealing or all those other bad things, that there's a different choice for them. And so this gives them options. And I've interviewed these kids. Uh, the school specifically that I've researched is called GIDA, which is D-I-D-A, which is an all uh, women's group. Um, and it changes generations because then those women that are transformed, their children will have other opportunities. So this stuff, it, it impacts in a good way and in a bad way. It impacts generations. And we see that in our own society. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's fascinating that you get to see that culture and this culture and you're opening eyes and changing lives in both. Well, some of my... Uh, the colleagues at UK, where my doctorate is from in Kentucky, they're like, how did you get such a cool area of research in Brazil? You know, I'm like, pick it. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> you know, that's it's right. your choice. That's right. If you want to choose Iceland, not, nothing against Iceland. Yeah. But I, I wanted to go somewhere where the drumming was hip and the weather was warm. You can leave with a tan. That's right. Um, so you're, do, you're obviously doing a lot of really cool stuff and you're uh, on the college campus. We're, we're, we as a culture in America are going through a lot of changes and there's a lot of turmoil at times on college campuses. Have you seen, have you, you've been able to witness shifts in what people, what kind of students you get. And, you know, I don't know a lot about UT Martin. It seems like a great school. There's a lot of really smart people here that went to UT Martin. Have you seen, and I know you obviously have lots of colleagues, including your husband, right. you know, what, what, um, what's your observations on college culture these days? Yeah, I, I've actually been really encouraged by that. I mean, my students have always been pretty generally cosmopolitan and, and liberal, um, because I guess because of me and they probably people that are more conservative, you know, since the way I'm my bread is buttered and they don't want to study with me. So I tend to attract like-minded, uh, like-spirited uh, musicians. Uh, but then I teach, for example, a world music class to all of our incoming freshmen in the music department, which is typically 40 to 45 students. And I do it so I'll learn all their names, uh, but I also do it because I want to shake them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk, the first thing we do is we talk about global issues. So they have to listen to the news every day and they have to say, um, what's on your mind? Okay, tell me what's going on. And, and it's not just West Tennessee news. They need to be listening to, you know, I'll usually have them listen to like NPR up first if they don't know anything else to listen to. And they'll get some global news. And they 
are just fascinated, first of all, that they don't know what's going on in the world. And then they're empowered by it. They're like, man, so in Japan today, this happened and I can't believe. And then they start to form opinions, which is what they should do for right. themselves. And so I don't teach them to challenge everything that their parents have ever taught them. Um, but I do say that it's okay to question that and to figure out, you know, is that your choice or is that because you've been taught that for decades? And it's okay to step back and go, do I think that? Or was I made to think that? And and then choose for yourself. And usually it's somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. You know, usually they take a little bit of that and a little bit of choose your own adventure. But with the students, the past several years, I have seen such an, and especially the last two years, I wonder if it's coincidental, not probably, but I have seen a lot of um, kindness and tolerance um, of, of diversity, of other cultures, of minorities. And I think that, um, you know, these students are seeing the news and, and they're scared. I mean, I, I can never remember a time when I would have think about myself that, you know, my own kids would be impacted by global warming or climate change or, you know, all, all this craziness that's ha- all this hate that's in the news right now. And I, I think the students are, are, are scared and, and, and ticked, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, why does, is my, future uh, so so bleak and Mm -hmm. why is why am I growing up in in this time when hatred and and fear seem to rule um, decision making by people that should know better and they want to do something about it and I I rarely even if a student is pretty conservative financially they're bold um, spiritually and in terms of how they feel about their fellow man so that's been great to see I have been curious what this generation of kids who are coming of age in this culture what they will be like 30 years you know they look at people like us in my generation and look at what formed us and what formed our thinking and yeah. so it, it will be interesting to see it will be interesting um, I have hope though I have hope. oh I, you know what I mean I've I've I get to be around a lot of college and young folks like Luke here. Yeah. Um, and um, no, I, I tell my wife, I'm like, you would not believe how smart and sharp and good those young professionals are that I get to work with every day. It's it's absolutely been like so inspiring no, since that's, coming that's here. Why, that's one of the great things about the job that you have, Scott, and the job that I have. But, you know, people um, stagnate in the teaching profession. Um, but, you know, if you surround yourself by really great, like-minded young people, they're going to push you to stay at the top of your game and to know mm-hmm. what the current, you know, for me, it's what's the current percussion music out there, you know, because mm-hmm. you get out of school for a long time and you feel disconnected. And so I think that's a great way to stay connected to to cur- currently what's going on in your field, but also to the next generation. So we mentioned uh, Jorge, uh, but I know you didn't end up with Jorge. I did not. I ended you, up with David. And so, David, <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your husband. David Coffey is my husband. My last name is Hill, and his last name is Coffey, but we are married. Um, I was just 30. How old was I? Just very progressive. Well, 33, and I had a career, and David's really liberal. And he even said, <laughs> do you want me to take your name? You know, so I'm like, well, that's just, it's easier. We don't have to change the paperwork. So, yeah, go. so David is um, a, a historian. He is a, a world-class historian. He has, uh, I think he just, well, he has three uh, books that he did on his own. He's got several encyclopedias that he's contributed to. And then a textbook just uh, released uh, several weeks ago, actually, in harm's way that had three collaborative uh, world-class historians, David being one of them, and that's an Ox- 